Good afternoon. We're at the Guild Hall in East Hampton on Main Street. We're here with Ellen Frank, and it has been a glorious run of your beautiful show, Cities of Peace. Thank you. It's been yeah, fantastic. I want you to tell, tell everybody about your show and, and how you feel about it. Sure. So these paintings honor world cities traumatized by war. And the goal of the paintings is to transform suffering and anguish into beauty. And the paintings include major cities and the culture then of these cities, Jerusalem, Beijing, Lhasa, Kabul, Baghdad, Monrovia, New York, Hiroshima, and Sarajevo. So they're all done with 22 karat gold leaf mm -hmm. and egg tempera on Belgian linen. And it's been a thrill to have people come and be moved by them and in your, love in your them. Own, in your own hometown. In my own hometown. Yeah. So um, now that we're here and uh, there are not so many people, it's a lovely occasion. We could walk around and see the paintings individually with you as our guide. Wouldn't that, would that be, be a good wonderful. idea? This is a spectacular painting in black with, 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 with these ornate red columns on either side of the palace. But I think you have to tell us about it because you know the history so well. I'm delighted to tell you about it. This is called Lhasa, 10 Directions. In the Buddhist tradition, the bowing and the prayers are always for all directions, up, down, left, right, north, south, east, west, and then all the fractions of directions in between. So this is, in fact, honoring the Patala, which Frank Lloyd Wright said is the greatest unarchitected building in the world. It is the erstwhile home of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. What is interesting, too, is that we have what's called the Lingor Line. And this Lingor Line traverses the painting, it's actually a pathway around all the sacred cities in La the sacred sites in Lhasa, and monks walk in meditation around the pathway along the Lingor line. And Elena, the columns that you've pointed out are in fact ornate red columns. They're from the Jokung Monastery in Lhasa, which is the old, one of the oldest monasteries there. And then on the top and the bottom, we have sacred hand traditions or sacred hand positions. These are called mudras, and each one has a special significance. For instance, this position is the prayer position, but unlike hands put together as a kind of pancake, this has an opening with the cross thumbs, and it symbolizes the lotus blossom, which is a major symbol and evocation in Buddhism, saying that each of us is like a lotus blossom. We grow from the mire. Each of the cities of peace has a touch of crimson leaf in honor of the dead. In this painting, the crimson is in the window of the Patala, and the Dalai Lama tells a story of how as a young boy, he looked out the window at a shrine and he wanted to go and visit it. But he was told he had to reach another stage of enlightenment in his practice before he would be allowed to go there. And sadly, the invasion of 1959 and the hostilities interrupted that dream, and he was forced into exile before he ever visited that shrine. And my last note is we have a four-line poem that was written in the fourth century by a Bon poet. So here we have the different colors actually taken from the precious metals of the illuminated manuscripts found in the Patala. And it says, this center of heaven, this core of the earth, this heart of the world fenced round with snow. Beautiful. 
Beijing is a sacred city, um, it was actually designed as a sacred city. So Beijing is no accident. It was conceived of and placed exactly where it is and built all by design and by different philosophical systems. So the painting of Beijing is almost a grid which happens to be the city plan of old Beijing, taken really from before the Ming Dynasty. And this represents perfect mathematical proportions. So the mathematicians of China designed the city with this concept of heavenly perfection and earthly perfection. In the center, of course, is the forbidden city. The second philosophical system that governed the siting of Beijing is geomancy, or the use of geography and the positioning on land. And so Beijing was sited with a north-south axis, which governs the structure of the painting itself. Third, Confucius and Confucius Confucian philosophers cited Beijing by use of the trigram, as we would use the I Ching, throwing the die and coming up with an affirmation that, yes, Beijing should be right here. So these trigrams line the right border of the painting. And the last philosophical system is the astronomical system. The great astronomers consulted the stars, and the stars, in fact, confirmed the sacred nature of the site. This is the star pattern by these circles and lines. The star pattern is called the purple protected enclosure. And then Beijing has two dancing figures here and here, and the little hairdo on the top of each figure is ornamented by a tiny gold constellation. I'll conclude by saying that Beijing has its crimson leaf along Tiananmen Gate. And it felt very ironic and sad to me that in Chinese the word Tiananmen means heavenly peace. Because as I said earlier, Beijing was meant to be an earthly mirror of divine order where the emperor of the sun lived. So Beijing is called Beijing, heavenly peace on earth. We're here with my favorite painting, Hiroshima. And Ellen will tell us about her inspiration. And uh, it's just a magnificent painting with the plum blossoms. Tell us about it, Ellen. Thank you, Elena. Hiroshima is called Hiroshima Winter Bloom for the plum blossom that cascades across the painting blooms in winter. We usually think of Japan and its spring cherry blossoms. But the significance of the winter plum blossom, winter blooming plum blossom, is special because of what's happened in Hiroshima. The entire painting itself is actually taken from what's called the pre-attack mosaic. That's a photograph, an aerial reconnaissance photograph taken by the US military right before we dropped the bomb. And so what we have is, this is called moon gold, this pinkish, beautiful gold. Moon gold is the waterways here from the photograph. And the white gold across the entire painting is its land. Then hidden in, almost as ghosts, into the painting is the figure standing either frontal or sideways, never the victim never with recrimination, never with anger, just as witnesses. 
except for one moment, one figure, just as the plum blossom blooms in winter, one figure is doing a dance. So this dancing figure happens to have her outlines come in a black rectangle, a moment in the painting where the moon gold waterways meet the branches of the plum, the winter blooming plum blossom and meet the outline of the dancing figure. I also want to mention the portraits of three of the medieval emperors of Hiroshima. Hiroshima, we, we don't know how we imagine it in our consciousness. And who of us thought ever that it was a beautiful, feudal mountain village above a bay? But it was. Why don't you just walk us over to uh, Sarajevo? What I didn't know, however much pride I have in my educational awareness in the world, I did not know that in 1991, Sarajevo was the site of the single largest book burning in modern history. More than two million books were intentionally destroyed by three guided missiles that targeted the town hall, which was also the library. What I've had to learn from Sarajevo is that not only do these paintings honor the human beings who lost their lives and the people who were not yet born or the people who live in these cities, but the paintings also honor the cultural richness of these cities. And when something like this destruction of two million books, and I might add 1,500 illuminated manuscripts, when that occurred, that's what we've come to call culture aside. We not only see genocide in this, these paintings, but we've come to see culture aside. This bombing effectively wiped out the entire recorded history of Bosnia-Herzegovina forevermore. The painting is like a giant illuminated manuscript or like two pages side by side of an open illuminated manuscript. And as in others of the Cities of Peace painting, this is building for building Sarajevo. It's organized by a 12-pointed star from Islam. And this star happened to be used by the Sufi order of Islam. And the dervish hall in which the star appeared on the wall, or still appears on the wall, is in the bottom right of the left-hand page. I love this star. And it took a long time to get this star perfect in this painting. One of the things I loved about the star was that its horizontal banding ended in this pattern. This pattern is actually called kufic. It's stylized Arabic, and it's a prayer, but for the Muslim people, this pattern reads, la la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, the declaration that Muhammad is their prophet. Then we have, as, as it used to be pre-1991, that the three major Abrahamic faiths lived in harmony, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, so we honor all three religions. The Sarajevo Haggadah, one of the great Haggadot, they're named for places. The Haggadah uh, accompanies the Passover feast, was smuggled out of Spain, and now resides in Sarajevo, hence its name. And I might add that during Nazi occupation, and during the 1990s hostilities, the Sarajevo Haggadah was saved by Muslims. We have here the sun image from the Haggadah. And then we have two letters that look like Hebrew, but in fact are Aramaic. And they say here, it can even happen here. 
and we have a reference to the great cathedral of Sarajevo and its special window. So we have Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, and the great Islamic image of the cosmos, all in the painting Sarajevo. So too, we have the deeded text written in Arabic, written by Ghazi Husrev Bey, who deeded the land that became Sarajevo. And we have the waterways and the footpaths from the earliest known map of Sarajevo. We also have something, again, to conclude about architecture. Architecture, again, is a structure that governs memory and a symbol for the human mind. So here, the crimson leaf honoring the dead also honors the book. The crimson hugs the eve of the town hall library. And so too, instead of castles decorating the corners of illuminated pages, we have another view of the town hall decorating the top of this illuminated page. So it's a very special painting, and it took us three years to complete, and I'm so glad it's here. This is called Baghdad, City of Peace, Truly. And you might wonder, is that ironic given the killings and war in Baghdad? It's actually not meant ironically. Baghdad is referred to or has been referred to by the Iraqi people themselves as Dar es Salaam, meaning city of peace. So Baghdad takes its border pattern from the al Qadamain Mosque, and I'm going to pause there. I say takes its border pattern, and I'm pausing because this is a reference to the great tradition of illuminated manuscripts. So while we think of illuminated manuscripts as very small, which they are, and they're kept in beautiful museums and libraries under glass, so the cities of peace are monumental illuminated manuscripts, each made on Belgian linen with 22 karat gold leaf, or here with palladium leaf, and with egg tempera, with clay, and with all the antique materials that made the ancient illuminated manuscripts so stunning and precious. Baghdad was originally a round city. And this is from the earliest map of Baghdad, in which it had four gates to the city. And it was very special. The caliph lived in the center with his palace and his mosque. And it was during the heyday of Baghdad, when Baghdad was the center of writing and literature. And it had the first libraries outside of Egypt and booksellers and merchants. And in fact, we would not have the great classics of Greek from Greek and Latin had the Arabic scholars not first translated them into Arabic while the rest of Europe was in the Dark Ages. So this is Baghdad as the round city. It was an experiment in governance and the caliph found that his presence in the center had an inhibiting impact. So he moved out of the center to free the merchants and the booksellers. We have here the crimson leaf again in the honor of the dead. And what I placed in the center in which the crimson leaf appears is called a mukarnas. This is the inside of an Islamic dome. If you look up at the top, and traditionally the great ones were done with mirrors. So this is all done in palladium leaf. Also, across the entire work, these small triangles are cuneiform text from the earliest known creation myth, predates 
Noah and the flood predates Genesis, predates Gilgamesh, and it is translated for us as well. And I want to just mention a few more things. As in Jerusalem, as in Kabul, as in Sarajevo, Baghdad is building for building Baghdad. So we see all the buildings here. We see sky, water, land, water, land, water, land. And the al Qadamain Mosque on the border, to which the border refers, is also in the center. You can see the minarets and the courtyard structure. This is in 22 karat gold, but tucked in is also red gold. This aqua color is a secret and sacred color to Islam. We uh, continue in the main gallery, and we are approaching Kabul. And Kabul never looks so beautiful to me. Kabul is, uh, is it all in, in mono monochromes, monotones, and yet it, it, it really uh, is exciting. I guess the gold leaf and, and the poetry bring it to life, too. You tell us about Kabul. Well, Kabul, the Kabul, Kabul of Afghanistan is um, actually the buildings are made from mud, which, as you know, or earth, which, as you know, crumbles and becomes very dusty. So the title of Kabul is Kabul, I love her, for love and knowledge both come from her dust. What walks up the street of Kabul in the painting is a love poem from the 17th century. And it is, celebrates the city. And it has that line, but I love her, for knowledge and love both come from her dust. So the painting is actually taken from a black and white photograph that was found in the archives of the British military. It was taken when the British occupied the city in the late 19th century. And in Kabul, because of the location of the city in Afghanistan and trade routes and the Silk Route and the Khyber Pass, Kabul was constantly invaded. So rather than invading the city with marching men, we put along the street the poem I have just mentioned. And then there are two dancing figures at the top. They're twirling. We know that it was the birthplace of Rumi, who then left Kabul, but who founded the whirling dervishes. And along this figure, it says, I sing. I sing. I want to call your attention to the right edge of the painting. Here we have the activities that the Afghan people have been forced to relinquish under Taliban rule. We have the open face of the woman who's now forced to cover with a burqa. And we have jewelry and adornments. We also have a double reference here to the bodhisattva, who's generally male, but adorned. And we have beneath this figure the Afghan kite. For the kite runner, the book, the Afghan people flying kites with such exuberance, that became prohibited as well. This Afghan kite, they're in unusual shapes, Elena. And this kite actually has the colors of the Afghan flag. And then we have one of the indigenous musical instruments. The Afghan people were forbidden to play music. And then we have a gathering of a figure playing the tambourine and another reading a book. Small, joyous gatherings of scholars and musicians have also been forbidden. Each of these refers to a very specific artifact. 
And then we have the rose, for the poet compares Kabul to the rose and says, even the rose is jealous of Kabul's, um, let me get the line exactly. The rose is jealous of its lash-like thorns. So the harshness of Kabul is celebrated rather than criticized by a poet who loves it. Uh, Monrovia, we were asked to paint Monrovia by Jean-Marie Guajeno, who was the Under Secretary General of the United Nations in charge of peacekeeping. At the time that Jean-Marie asked us to paint um, Monrovia, it was the only world capital with no electricity and no running water. What the painting does is it depicts the night sky in Monrovia, and it's a particular night sky. It's the night sky on July 26, 1847, at 10 p.m. It's the night sky you would have seen if you stood in Monrovia at 10, looking up on the day that Liberia gained its independence. Liberia is named for freedom, of course, and Monro Monrovia is named for President Monroe, who wanted to have the slaves, the American slaves, a home where they would be free. So the name of the country is Liberia, and they honored President Monroe by naming the capital Monrovia. The former slaves are not referred to that way anymore. They're called repatriated Liberians. And also, what we now call ethnicities, we used to call tribes. There are more than 16 ethnicities living in Liberia and in Monrovia. It's the night sky that in fact unites all these different ethnicities because the children of all of them play together equally under the twinkling stars. Also, Monrovia is a map, and it's you, you as a viewer get in two positions. You get to fly through the air and look down at Monrovia, which is contraintuitive. Uh, Monrovia, the land, is actually blue, where the wa whereas the water is moon gold and white gold and palladium leaf. So you're looking down at the land from above just as you then have occasion to stand on the earth and look up at the night sky. I want to mention the crimson leaf in this painting. Hidden into the indigo as the only color in this painting other than these turquoise lines, hidden in the indigo is a mask the mask that the spirit performers use and wear, and they're actually called masks, the people who perform the spirit dances. So we have tucked in a nose, a mouth, the eyes, and we have the earring and the headdress. And this earring is what we've chosen to color crimson leaf. Ellen, we're, we're, um, we're, we're we see a beautiful vertical painting of New York, and uh, I could say that's my kind of town. And in <laughs> fact, <laughs> in fact, that's, that's almost what is said in the center of the painting, and you, you'll tell us about all the languages. I will. New York in the center of the painting says, New York is my city, and it says it in 30 or 40 languages, including Braille. It says it in English, of course, in French, in Chinese, in Arabic, in Hebrew, in Korean, in Swedish, in Polish. It says it for all the languages, or as many as we could get, of the people who live in New York. New York, the bottom of the painting is the tops of the building, 
and the top of the painting is the bottoms of the building. This is a painting that has three borders, not four, and I like to think of it as a page left of the book that opens to tell the story of New York. In illuminated in 22 karat gold leaf is the English New York is my city, and illuminated in palladium leaf is the Brooklyn Bridge. I think of the bridge not only as carrying visitors to New York, but also as energy lines connecting New York with the rest of the world. There's a special story about the crimson in New York. It's on the top right corner of the painting, and it's two parallel lines. Just as the surrealists did a kind of meditation when they worked, so when I work on these paintings, I take a meditative moment, and I ask questions in my notebook. And so I asked, how will I honor the Twin Towers? And the answer that came back was two straight lines like this. And I drew them in my notebook. And I asked my notebook and my muse, what, what are you talking about these two straight lines? And the answer again that came back was just do it. So I did the two crimson lines at the top with my wonderful interns. And after the painting was done, about two days later, I was looking through a book that friends had loaned me about New York. And there was a photograph of the Twin Towers at sunset. And the two edges of the towers were illuminated by the red setting sun and were in the exact proportion an exact scale as the two red lines in the painting. As you walk us through the cities of peace, th there is an incredibly uh, uh, elaborate history of architecture that you seem to be so well versed in. I think, did I, did I get this right, that you, had you written a book on architectural uh, history? Tell us about that. This is a good prompt, Elena. In fact, I wrote a book called Literary Architecture, Essays Toward a Tradition. It wasn't really on architectural history. It was on architecture as a symbol for the mind, for memory, and for consciousness. So in a sense, each of the cities of peace is a mnemonic or memory device meant to trigger recall of this or that great moment in history, the greatness of each city honored. And just as now we're talking th with ecology, we're talking about the warming of the earth and preservation of land and sustainability, so the Cities of Peace really admonishes us, sustain our cities that were the places, the sites of our great developments of civilizations and were the sites of great human monuments. So we gain knowledge as we recover a community of memories really shared by the world. Now we're in, in front of Jerusalem, which uh, takes me to the, to the moment in time when I first met Ellen. Ellen invited people to see her new painting uh, in her studio. And uh, this spectacular painting has a lot to tell. And Ellen tells it better than anyone. Oh, thank you. Jerusalem is called Jerusalem, a painting toward peace. And it is the first of the cities of peace. It was in gestation more than three years. And it took more than a year to paint. So it was the first painting. The border pattern here in Jerusalem has special meaning. It's an Islamic floral pattern, as we can see here. And the space between the flowers happens to be the Star of David. 
So the border pattern itself symbolizes the peace that the painting hopes for by blending Islam and Judaism together. So they flip and move back and forth around the borders of the painting. Jerusalem, like Baghdad, Kabul, like uh, Sarajevo, is building for building Jerusalem, taken from photographs that span more than 100 years. And filling Jerusalem are these tiny figures, each with his or her arms raised, both arms. And they're raised, I would want viewers to feel why they're raised and not to give the answer. There is no one answer to any image in a painting. For me, it was about apotheosis or transformation, as in the book of laughter and forgetting. Even in a dire situation, if we laugh, we somehow levitate a little above the earth. There are also two standing figures in Jerusalem, a painting toward peace and two sideways floating figures here with their arms outstretched. And in this figure, the lower half of her merges into the Dome of the Rock. So in this figure, the floral Islamic pattern runs through. And it's a very special painting for me. And Ellen, the, are, this, are these the... the um the, the olive trees in the old walled city? Yes, is this is the old walled city with the golden gate and the olive trees, all done in egg tempera. The painting, in fact, is all the paintings are either with clay, which is called bowl. It's the clay that traditionally goes underneath gold leaf. And this is egg tempera. In the history of painting, the moment of egg tempera was in medieval times, and it was the um, really the the what's the word for it? It was what held the pig. It was the binder that held pigment together, and it was a breakthrough then in the Renaissance when pigment was held together by oil. So actually, this painting is quite a feat of modern technology combined with the ancient because it's state-of-the-art chemists who made for me a ground, this white is a ground, we call it, that is f can be used on a flexible support such as the Belgian linen, and yet the egg tempera will not crack. It used to be that you could only work on a rigid surface, as the medieval paintings show. They're painted on wood, which has to be cradled in the back. It's a fascinating painting. Ellen. Thank you. And I love the way it's presented. It, and you think the light itself, with the gold leaf and the, and the, the silver leaf, the light itself. Well, it has four different colors of gold in it. and. Um, this painting brought great good fortune. It was seen at the party that you came to, and then it was seen by the head of philanthropy at the Edgar Bronfman Center at NYU and taken to their boardroom. And from that, I was invited to do the Cities of Peace as a body of work, and from that invitation, came the opening of our illumination atelier with our young interns from more than 17 countries. So Jerusalem, in fact, was a doorway to honoring all the other cities in the sequence, the Cities of Peace sequence. Uh, there is a wonderful film that Don Lenzer, a professional filmmaker, did of the making of Cities of Peace. Part of what makes me so happy about the film is that you can see close-ups of the faces of the young interns. We had interns from Carnegie Mellon, 
We had foreign exchange interns from Hong Kong and Korea. Then we had interns from Estonia, Colombia, Poland, Scotland, and the movie catches them working. It catches literally the making of Cities of Peace. It's the Forbidden City, it's the Golden Heart. This is a map of old Beijing from the Ming Dynasty. It actually predates the Ming Dynasty. Good, good stroking. That's the way you want to do it. Good. And we're going to pull the tape off. When the leaf is done, or the, or the glue is done. Mm -hmm. No, you're, you're a little too low. I think we should put the gold on the boundary, but keep the like skinny lines, like skinny empty lines. So when you're saying it, putting it on the boundary, stay here. I want to know if you mean the red. It's almost one of their red imperial colors. You're saying put gold yeah. here. Yeah. yeah. I think this line will be very important gold, but we're gonna. I think if this gets gold. Here. Yeah, I think maybe we'll fill this in gold. What's really special to me right now is this morning we had a group meeting in which we decided to work collaboratively. We decided to brainstorm together about how to handle Beijing. Like nice the, work, Margaret. The narrow line, like, yeah. the narrow line. Instead of having it where they're executing my ideas only. We're talking about using the apprentices in a different way rather than s simply as assistants. So I'm actually very moved because they've participated in the decision making about this. The Chinese have a way of thinking about recarving the past, of making new the past, and they do it to discover exemplary moral conduct and exemplary behavior. We'll cut each, each trigram apart and space them down a little bit more so we can see what they would look like coming all the way down. Keep them, we'll play with them, but let's play with them first in circles. Okay. Here we're taking the oldest map of Beijing and we're making it new. And we're taking the heart of the Forbidden City and we're rendering it in exquisite gold leaf. Wow.
when Lhasa was still a sacred city, we're going to diagram the skyline or outline the skyline of the mountains of Tibet. We will have the Patola and then references to the other great mountain ranges within the sacred circumambulation of it, all in gold against the black. This is the Lingor line. This is the sacred circumambulation path. And it cuts down and circles and comes around again. And it's the path of all the pilgrims because it circles all the sacred buildings in Lhasa. So it navigates Lhasa the same way it's going to navigate our painting. And then the hands on the top are called mudras, and each one symbolic has symbolic meaning. I think every culture from the cave, from uh, Lascaux and the earliest caves, um, have the record of the human handprint. And what's really nice is that all the people who were working on this painting, we all put our hands up there. So that's what the painting is. It turns out that the illuminated manuscripts kept in the patola, they have seven lines of color. Each line of the illuminated manuscript, each line of text is in a different color. Gold, silver, copper, bronze, conch shell, turquoise, coral. We're going to have a rainbow of a very early Tibetan poem because they believe that the first Tibetans came down from the heavens on this ladder, a ladder of a rainbow to the mountaintop. So that's what's going to come down this painting. This is a roughly 1935 photograph, and this is where, where the monks and all the sacred high-up officials were camping at the base of the Patola, the home of the Dalai Lama. So we're going to superimpose this. See, this looks like there are no mountains, right? Yeah. Voila! <laughs> Look at that! Is that amazing? It's just that there's cloud cover. It's the exact same oh, angle hey. of the patola. And I kept thinking, oh, it's such a shame that the picture we have doesn't have any mountains. <laughs> this is what we're going to do with leaf. That's going to be a lot. A lot of tiny lines. So why don't you do be a spot, do what's called spot checking. The problem is this black will kill a brush. It destroys a brush, so you have to keep your brush wet at all times. So you're going to take some of Holly's black and use your brush. And just scoop it out here. Good work, Carlos. Good. And it's these kinds of details, Carlos, even though you have a big painting, it's these kinds of details that say to the viewer, I'm a beautiful, gorgeous painting. These details talk. They're like really precious moments in a painting. Margaret, as long as you're doing it, make sure you're perpendicular and <laughs> use the T-square. All right. I'll check the other ones. Yeah. All the tape? All of it? Just up, up to everything you. where you believe.
is good. Oh, it looks great. I mean, the pattern continues, so it's great. And then I think we're going to need to put this on the floor, the, the painting. Okay, so I'll, I'll do that. Because we're going to pour onto it. The issue is, this is the pre-attack map of Hiroshima right before the Americans bombed. And this is a cascade of plum blossoms over the map. Does the map go over the branch or the branch over the map? I'm going to leave it with one area where the map goes over the branch. Right here. So this, when I said that this is going to get leafed, this is the pre-attack map yeah. of Hiroshima going up there. These are the waterways. The white gold, the moon gold is the, or the waterways. So here, the waterway and the branch coincide. And that's where I'm making a decision. That's going to be a gorgeous scene of Hiroshima now. Okay. There's a poem from a 17th century Sufi mystical poet from Kabul, a poem celebrating Kabul. The text is going up through the road, through this portion. Kabul wears a rugged mountain skirt, and the rose is jealous of its lash-like thorns. The dust of Kabul's blowing soil smarts lightly in my eyes, but I love her. For knowledge and love both come from her dust. I love that. There's our Empire State Building. Isn't that cool? See, we're always playing with positives and negatives. So you'd think the land is the positive and the water is the negative, and the water is the positive for us. It really catches the light. Inside of Manhattan, in about 50 different languages, it's going to say, this is my city in everything, in Swahili, in Japanese, in Chinese, in all, every language you can think of, it's going to say, New York is my city. So that's New York.